I now invite Professor Viwan Ling, who's from the Division of English in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences of Nanyang Technological University. Thanks very much. Um, the title of my presentation is, uh, is uh, The Trajectory of Asian Consumption um, from Shopping in Singapore to Consuming East Asian Pop Culture. So I'll deal directly with the pop culture. Professor Chua bing earlier work on consumption and its link with urban culture goes back to at least 1990 with his essay, Steps to Becoming a Fashion Consumer in Singapore. You can ask him about that yourself. Many of the essays or articles related to Singapore have been collected, as Megan has pointed out, in Life is Not Complete Without Shopping, Consumption, Culture in Singapore. His fundamental stance, I think, is that consumption inevitably increases with the emerging middle class and that during the East Asian miracle years, quote, sustained economic growth has tried translated into a rapid uh, transfer expansion of consumerism as part of daily life. And indeed, by the time of the 1997 economic crisis, the broad-based broad expansion of uh, consumption had already been established in most of the affected locations in industrialized East and Southeast Asia, spawned not only by, he says, by rapid economic growth in contemporary Asia, but also by the global expansion of consumerism. So I think it's very important being what goes from global to Singapore and then to region in some ways. There are a number of positions that uh, Bing Huat adopts that will recur in his later analysis of East Asian mass culture. One key position is uh, that he was and remains against a notion of blunt Americanization or cultural imperialism that meant that, quote, the invasion of Western goods and culture under the condition of rising prosperity would threaten the cultural identity of Singapore youth. This stand um, similarly applies to various forms of Chinese language uh, pop, uh, music, music that circulated in the city-state in the 80s and 90s. So he says here, indeed a major teenage phenomenon in Singapore is the fandom of Mandarin and Cantonese pop singers from Taiwan and Hong Kong. The reference points for Singapore's youth, how therefore, is a mix of global mix of images of youth instead of confusion. However, consumption of global images unavoidably passes through local, cultural, and political conditions. So the point he makes is that local does commingle with the difference from various other cultures, West and East, and does not confuse, but instead passes through the lenses, the lens and the practices of the local, even when what arrives are supposed notions of Chineseness. So if any binary discourse of Asian versus Western values are debunked, so are discourses of the Asian or even the Chinese. I think that, again, is a very important point. Uh, Beng Huat also tends not to be overly concerned with the theoretical and analytical approaches of what he calls uh, postmodern writers. I think by this he's referring to specific types of cultural studies criticism that was going on on both sides of the Atlantic which dealt with style as the resistant expression of subjective individual collective identities. Instead, his chosen focus is on, quote, the political and economic conditions that underpin consumption as a social cultural phenomenon at a time when these conditions have often been neglected by many, many analyses which are focused on consumption purely as a form of identity politics. So I think the point is that he's, he's, he's not against cultural criticism of a certain sort. Uh, and he quotes Dick Hevditch in, in uh, one of his pieces. But the point is to emphasize the purely, right? And I think in that respect, it's very interesting that, of course, what Bing Huat deals with is mainstream mass culture because it's not, from that point of view, all resistance or not resistance in that particular sense of uh, you know, resisting hegemonic identity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As the East Asian pop culture scene quite surprisingly expanded in the 90s, from sort of Chinese music to Japanese to Korean uh, dramas, TVs, films, the trajectory of Bing Huat's work on consumption expanded to cover Asia. Asia, of course, here occurs within scare quotation quotes. He had written accurately in 2000, quote, it is obvious that the 1997 economic crisis has not and will not lead to a regression to before the days of the miraculous growth of the 1960s. When recovery comes around and as confidence expands, 
the consumption of lifestyles will surely begin again, unquote. But I think no one could have fully expected the massive and rapid developments that transpired. You might say that the essays collected and then reworked for the 2012 book Structure, Audience and Soft Power East Asian Culture, Pop Culture, which is the main text that I will focus on now, ask the question, is there really such an entity now apparently mass culturally imagined into existence called East Asian pop culture? The cultural phenomena surveyed from the 1990s, along with a significant amount of the research in the field that he considers, taken together, he concludes, quote, constitute a larger entity of East Asia pop culture as a loosely integrated cultural economy, unquote. So the economy exists, and there is, is a more cultural sense of East Asia that comes about. The audience reception to particularly television dramas, quotes, evinces the emergent possibility of a sense of the pan-East Asia, East Asian, unquote. But he goes on to say, which does not amount to a stable identity, but nevertheless retains a certain coherence. So we definitely see something, but what exactly is it that we see? While Bing Huat modestly describes the book as an introductory text that he says parasitically draws on the existing research, especially empirical research, as you can imagine, in order to attempt a relatively coherent mapping of the contours of the object of analysis, unquote, I think that the book is more an innovative setting out of what he believes are the most salient intellectual and practical approaches to research. And this orientation is also a general stance that is taken on mass cultural studies in and of East Asia. Fundamentally, the book thinks through the boundary, through, I'm going to say just four items. First, the boundary crossings that are incurred in both mass cultural production and consumption, or specifically audience reception. Two, the need for comparative analysis to gain a non-national view of the, or non-national views of the phenomena, Three, the possibility of imagining East Asia, given the existing uh, political realities of modern East Asian state formation and war history. And four, the difficulty in gaining any effective national soft power advantage from mass cultural success, given the larger history of political fracture. The work deploys a a difference between pop culture, profit-driven mass entertainment, and popular culture in the ways that uh, Megan has already set out. And so, and by popular culture, he describes it this way in the book, the larger cultural sphere that encompasses the everyday life of the masses in contradiction to and contestation with elite culture. And this, I'll discuss this very briefly afterwards, is what checks soft power in, some, in, in a key respects. Now, how... Can all the, how do all these issues, how might they be addressed methodic, methodologically also follows from his earlier emphasis, which I mentioned, on the political and economic conditions that underpin consumption rather than on content. The content of any cultural product is evanescent, though content, quote, necessarily constitutes some of the empirical material for analysis. The larger analytic interest should be oriented towards the, and this is the key emphasis, the structures and modalities through which the products partake in the political, social, cultural, and economic material relations within the different locations where the products are produced, circulated, and consumed. Now, naturally, of course, as a literary and cultural critic, I have a response to this to come to above. But Chun Bing Huat makes effective use of this grounded and material approach uh, in the book. Importantly, the thrust of what has just been said clearly fits into the overall trajectory of the Inter-Asia Cultural Studies Project itself right from its very inception where in its editorial statement, the the co-editors wrote about the 1980s, a pervasive vertex of the rise of Asia, how problematic this is. And yet, you know, there has an an ongoing need to, quote, question and critique the rhetorical unities of both the rise and of Asia. And clearly, the book and his work and the work he's encouraged 
through his interaction in the region and elsewhere, has helped bring into ac intellectual and academic existence this particular way of approaching East Asian mass culture, or approaching this uh, East Asian mass culture with these questions at the back. So I offer now what I take to be some of the most salient intellectual contributions that emerge from this particular book and methodology. To begin with, there is important a reminder that new communications technology helped the circulation of TV dramas from Japan, South Korea, etc. He reminds his reader that the political context of the weakening of authoritarian regimes that allowed for the liberalization of the media matters, so expansion did not occur in a void. And in relationship to this sort of uh, new culture productions in region, uh, Bing Huat elevates TV amongst uh, the three three general areas, um, t uh, television, film, and pop music. There's also a chapter, important chapter, on what uh, Bing Huat calls pop culture China, by which he does not refer, obviously, to mainland Chinese pop culture, but Chinese language pop culture in their totality. So what's important here is that he wants to stress that the burst of Korean and Japanese dramas and etc., etc., that that occurred in the 90s onwards followed the distribution flow of pop culture China. So in this, uh, in this, with this particular development, a new possibility of Asian identity comes about because of uh, entanglement. And he says, without the massive and well-established pop culture China market and its audience that receives the Japanese and Korean pop culture from different Chinese languages, flows and exchanges uh, between Japan, Korea, and particular East Asian locations, these exchanges, he says, would be merely bilateral rather than regional. So I think this is quite an important salutary reminder of the role of sort of multiple Chineseness, uh, Chinesenesses and, and the, so the new developments that occur. Another particular important thing here that he achieves in this chapter is to talk about the decentered structure uh, of, of these Chinese cultures that the configuration has, uh, he says, is materially and symbolically without any center. Any search for a cultural center would be in vain. So the different forms of Chinese, the complex complexity of subtitling in one form of Chinese with another form of Chinese, how do you dub, that sort of thing. And it's very important here because what he goes on to argue is that Chinese in English is a problematic term because it doesn't capture this particular complex complexity. So in place of Chinese, he suggests using the uh, Singapore term Huaren, Chinese people, as he, this can be used as a, a nation neutral, uh, but an ethnically, speci uh, ethnically uh, but still ethnically and culturally marked identity. And in, use, in saying this, he goes against the idea of uh, Shishume's idea of the Sinophone, because it doesn't quite, as a term, capture that complexity. So he says that um, if Francophone refers to Francophone refers to speakers of French and Anglophone refers to speakers of uh, of um, uh, English, then to which Chinese language does the Sino in Sinophone refer? Now he's quite sympathetic. I think he understands uh, Shishume's attempt to uh, circumvent China as a, the monolithic reference to Chinese culture, but the point is still made. And in fact, he also goes on to stress that when you look at these products, right, that when the Japanese and the Korean ride on the Chinese, you don't simply sit down and just feel Asian, that the viewing process in the empirical, survey, uh, empirical research he, he surveys both stresses similarity and difference, that the, the, the audience sees both or captures both at the same time. And, and so the, the otherness never simply goes away. And it's because of this he thinks that the soft, for soft power culture thesis or hope of maybe the Korean and Japanese governments very, very hard to fulfill. Because against uh, the possibilities of, as you might call it, multicultural uh, East Asian flows, is the sign of the nation, of the other form of the popular, which can be deployed against 
uh, this, these other cross-national identifications. And the audience that, so to speak, the audience that subscribes to the national popular, the national modern, outnumbers the viewing audience. So let me conclude by two individual, two of my own responses to Bing Huat's uh, vibrant intervention with its ability to suggest other connections and possibilities. The first response is to the question of content, uh, mainly narrative content as it appears in um, film and television dramas. Mass cultural content in dramas, of course, can be cliched and disposable. We know that, and uh, I admire people who do this because they go through 11 episodes of Japanese serials, a year-long uh, viewing of uh, Korean dramas, uh, historical dramas, and you just take real commitment. <laughs> Well, I, I leave that to you to decide. Anyway, <laughs> but some programs, despite its critique of content, will, have, will either possess more high-grade and imaginative con content or might stand out as representing or even contributing towards a key socio-cultural moment. After all, even a cliched mass culture has quality. We recognize that, yeah? Film and, film and televisual drama are aesthetic technologies suited for the representation and narrativizing of social worlds. Here, worlds re related to a putative regional economic system, which is clearly, I think, what is at stake here, or part of what is at stake here. Narrative figurations, Frederick Jameson has contended, have, quote, a structure that encourages a soaking up of whatever ideas that are in the air. Film as narrative text today conflates ontology with geography and endlessly processes images of the unmappable world capitalist system, unquote. The studying of key content in representative or otherwise significant productions must, of course, come to terms with the structures and modalities which the products partake in the political, social, cultural, and economic uh, material relations for an overall, overall, I think, grasp. Though clearly, uh, it's it's clear that literary and cultural criticism don't always manage to capture this. So I think this is a, it's a necessary corrective that uh, being what offers uh, uh, those of us who do uh, literary and cultural criticism. The second response pertains to the significance of uh, pop music in relation to how, as Bing Huat phrases it, the statistically overwhelming presence of a passive audience that can be transformed into an audience community or communities. Okay, so I think this is quite an important point also that he brings up. How, how is the passive consumer brought into view? Uh, and this is very important because he says, uh, first, the individuals that gather without any prior organization, so for example, a shopping center, right, some star appears, become aware of others who share the same passion and hence gain subjective, individualized realization of being part of a community, however ephemerally with the others. Second, the constituted crowd is inevitably transformed into a spectacle by media, uh, or I might add, recording companies' attention. So I think that the pop concert is worthwhile thinking about in terms of its live performance, recording and distribution, broadcasting, how this goes hand in hand with this question. Uh, Bing Huat feels that the conventional popularity of foreign uh, 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 foreign language pop music in any consumption location has always been limited to a smaller population of dedicated fans, largely because the majority of the potential audience do not possess the requisite skills to appreciate the lyrics of that song. Now, the language gap is certainly a challenge, and yet the ongoing spectacularization of, of K-pop, which succeeded J-pop, um, needs to make us rethink the significance of music and its present role in the imagination, imagining of Asia. So let me just play two short clips here. Um, this is, uh, features an up and rising K-pop uh, band, BAP, Best Absolute Perfect, <laughs> managed by, the, I'm sorry, I didn't make this up, by the Korean agency, yeah. Okay, all right, okay. Um, and I'm gonna show you two clips. One of them is in Bangkok, as part of a large uh, sort of spectacular, and the other one is in MTV, in New York City, in Times Square. So look at the audience. I think pay attention to the audience, that's the key thing that I'm concerned about. They're coming to Singapore in August if you're interested.
right now I'll move to the MTV studio in New York City overlooking Times Square. The picture windows overlook Times Square. So there's an audience down on the roadside who couldn't get in, the audience inside. The large picture windows give them semi access to the live presence of the real stars, but there's also a video screen and sound systems on Times Square at road level. But despite this, you'll see, or maybe not here, that when you take pictures, they don't take pictures of the video screen, they take pictures of the stars through the picture windows from the street level because the point is to capture live presence. Okay, uh, I'll try to wrap up now. <laughs> and I'll try to go fairly fast. In Bangkok, we see presumably both Sino Thai and Thais grooving to the music, seemingly overwhelmed by the live presences. The camera pans the audience and shows the fervor that we expect at such events. And it shows them singing the chorus of one shot in Korean. And we know this has been sort of singing in Japanese and Korean has been on since the late mid 90s. The concert is of course said to be is of course being broadcast in Korea by MBC, Manhua Broadcasting Corp. It is a statement at the least of desired soft power influence overseas. But the concert, of course, is more than that, as the Thai audience seems to me to be unlikely to be thinking about Korean national pride. I could be wrong. And more than one identity or cultural uh, event is being played out at the same time. The region seems ahistorically materialized on the state with no vestige of traditional Asia or the exotic in sight. National differences can be bridged in the seemingly post-ideological performance of mass culture, where Asian choice and the youthful desire for freedom of expression are valued. Young Asian bodies of different nationalities, because you know, people come in from other countries as well for these concerts, can resonate and reverberate together the audience and the singers. So a transnational staging of Asia transpires, in which, as a Japanese colleague of my friend says, the national is assumed as given, but somehow something oozes out of the national boundaries to the extent that those boundaries become opaque, almost invisible, though not necessarily subverted. The environment in New York City seems different from Thailand. It is emphatically more metropolitan, and yet a similar staging of a multiculturalism that has now turned to some, some sort of global cosmopolitanism seems to occur. If nothing else, then because the fact that it is MTV staging the event. The crowd itself is multiracial. The physical set of the studio is interesting. As I say, there's, there's this picture window thing, so you're quite inside. You're not, you're, even those are outside, you try to bring in. Right. Yeah. Um, after all, the idea is that we don't want you to be outside. And then the program will be later screened on MTV in Korea and in Japan. So the cultural and geography exceeds MBC's concert in Bangkok, but the former is crucially linked to the latter at the same time. So Benghuat brings up a term that really needs to, needs to be exploited. He brings up the term immaterial labor. So how is all this immaterial labor? How does this work with cultural productivity required so that the economic, regional economic development can continue and expand through reproducing a shared or at least desired vision of everyday urban life in which hip Koreanness can appear in the Big Apple, even as political tensions in East Asia remain significant. So Professor Chua Bing Huat's work takes us all along good distance down the road in the study of East Asian pop culture, for which we are grateful, and his work also tells us that much more awaits to be done. Thank you.